What's up, everyone? My name is Alon. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Alchemy. That's alchemy.com. If you're a builder in the space, definitely check it out. Uh, I also helped start another women's organization in crypto called We3. Also check that out. Um, so what we're going to do now, we learned a little bit about crypto. We learned a little bit about Web3. Now we're going to uncover the hood a little bit and learn about the blockchain. So first, I want to get some things straight. Blockchain does not equal crypto, and that does not equal Web3. In fact, they have a very specific relationship, and that is blockchain is the backbone of crypto and Web3. It is the infrastructure engine that powers those two industries. And this is really, really important. So how should you think about blockchain? Well, it's literally a chain of blocks. You can think about it as blocks strung together piece by piece. One number goes up. They're all sequence in order. And that's kind of how you can frame it. And you might be wondering, what are in these blocks? Well, blocks you can literally think about as storage units, right? So they're storage units that store arbitrary data. And that depends on the blockchain's implementation. So it can store different types of things. Um, so we're going to look at an example real quick. And this is a very specific example. Uh, we're going to look at Bitcoin. And when I say Bitcoin, I actually mean Bitcoin, the blockchain, not the currency. We all are very, very familiar with Bitcoin as a currency. Bitcoin is really what took crypto to the mainstream. It's kind of the first cryptocurrency. It's really what made it popular. We're going to uncover the hood on Bitcoin as a blockchain. So let's get into it. So don't be intimidated. There's a bunch of numbers here. There's numbers and letters and cryptographic hashes, and this can be very intimidating. Don't be intimidated. We're going to break this down right now. So this is Bitcoin block 720142. And what I literally did is went online the other night took a screenshot of a Bitcoin block explorer and then pasted it in here. And this is this whole concept of things being public. Anyone can see any transactions that happen on the blockchain. So in the case of Bitcoin, Bitcoin stores transactions. Remember, blockchains are just storage units. So Bitcoin stores transactions. In this block specifically, we have 968 transactions. We see that in the top left corner here. If you go to the next slide, you can see that each of these transactions has a unique hash, and these are called transaction hashes. You can think about transaction hashes like, like receipts, like digital receipts, right? So if I go to the grocery store and I'm like buyer number 49, then I have 49 on my receipt. That's like what a transaction hash is. They're all unique identifiers. Transactions also have a unique value associated with them. So if we look at this first transaction here, this person sent four Bitcoin to someone else. That's a lot of money. Uh, so this is kind of a, a crazy transaction, but they have a specific value associated with them. We go to the next slide. And then they also have an input and output. So this is like the, the sender and the receiver. So every transaction has these sort of basic components, input, output, value, all of those things that we're familiar with. So how is this different from normal financial transactions? How does this differ from what we use every day? Well, let's break down what happens when you do a normal transaction. Let's say I go to a coffee shop and I wanna buy a cup of coffee. I often use my credit card to do that. And what happens with that credit card transaction is it gets sent to my bank and my bank reduces a certain amount of money from my account and maybe adds a certain amount of money to the coffee shop's account, right? And that bank is a central party that's controlling the checks and balances of our accounts. Now, where does that information get stored? Well, it actually gets stored in this third component here, which are servers. And these are private data servers. You might've heard this term server before. It's basically like a private storage unit that the bank controls. And this is a really, really important factor, right? The bank is controlling all of this information. So if banks were to one day wake up and say, hey, I'm feeling very malicious against Elon, they could go in and modify the amount of money I had. And because they're the only beholders of the truth, I couldn't really do anything about it. They control the data servers. This is really important. So let's do the same exact transaction, but let's use Bitcoin instead. All right, so I go and buy my cup of coffee and I make this Bitcoin transaction. Now, rather than getting sent to a centralized bank, this gets sent to a decentralized network of miners. Thousands and thousands of miners, anyone can be a miner, right? And every single one of those miners gets a copy of this transaction. And there are, there's also this concept of nodes, but we'll save that for another time. Um, so everyone gets a copy of this transaction, and now there's no longer one person who's the beholder of truth. And not only that, once that transaction is confirmed, it gets stored on a public ledger, on a blockchain. 
right? And so this is something that anyone can see. It's immutable. It's not in the private data server that anyone can modify or that a single person can modify. It's completely public and visible to everyone and no one can change it. So this is a really, really different model for a transaction than what we know and use today. So why is blockchain different? Why is this so important? Number one, it's public. All you need is the internet to access it. We heard about an example earlier in the Philippines using Axie Infinity. You can tap into the blockchain just with the internet. Number two, it's immutable. And this has to do with the security principles of blockchain. You can't change it. Once things are confirmed, they can't be modified. Number three, it's decentralized. Remember, there's a network of people running this blockchain. There's no single controller determining everything. Number four, it operates 24 seven. So no more nine to five waiting for the banks to open up and using it when people can actually go in and work. This whole thing is run by code. So a lot of the times people say crypto never sleeps. This is why it's completely automated. It's run by code. You don't have to worry about people behind it moving the levers. So you might be thinking, wow, those are amazing traits. But what if I want to do more than just transactions? What if I want to do more than just transact? So let's talk about Ethereum. All right, how is Ethereum different? The analogy I like to give is if Bitcoin is a simple calculator, then Ethereum is a smartphone. So it can do everything that Bitcoin can and more. And the reason is Ethereum allows you to store both transactions and arbitrary code. So now you can have things like NFTs and these applications and transact. So let's take a look at some examples that we could build. One, decentralized bank. So rather than having the central party determining your bank account, anyone can spin up a bank account and not have to go give their social security number or do all these things and get approved. You can just instantly get access to a bank. There's all these digital ownership marketplaces. So we talked about some examples of investing in creators. There's these whole new economies being created because of this. And then one that really stuck with me was this idea of global supply chain tracking. So provenance. If you don't know what provenance means, basically like, we have this global economy of products. How do we track every single hand that, that product gets placed in before it gets to me? We can do that using the blockchain because of its properties. What I really want to leave you with here is this is the internet today. There are all these applications, Uber, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of these applications that sort of run Web2 right now are siloed in data servers. They all control their data, only their teams can look at it, and none of it is shared. They own the data that we that we kind of produce. Now, the internet of tomorrow is this, it's blockchain. It's everyone is sharing the same information, everyone has the same database, database, and that means your application is on the same level as everyone else, no matter what. You're all tapping into that same information. And so, to give you some concrete examples about what this means, one password. So because I have this digital identity, rather than maintaining a hundred logins and forgetting all these passwords, that digital login can take with me, I can take it with me everywhere. Because remember, everyone's tapping into the same database. Number two, your network, your friends. All of my friends that I added on Facebook, and my generation doesn't really use Facebook as much anymore, or more Instagram, but all my followers and friends on Instagram, I can take them over to LinkedIn because those connections are stored on the blockchain and LinkedIn can know that I have those connections because we're all looking at that database. And then lastly is this concept of ownership. So one kind of concrete example here is, you know, my, my brother is a professional video gamer, so I like to use this example. If he acquires a, a sword, a magical sword, in the video game he plays is called Overwatch. So let's say he acquires this magical sword in Overwatch, he can now transfer that to another game like Fortnite, and it stays with him because he has one digital identity. So there's entirely new economies and entirely new products that can be produced from this technology. So the thought I wanna leave all of you guys with is, what is something in your life that you think can be revolutionized by a decentralized and public network? And thank you.